In this episode of the Project Management Podcast, we learn to actively engage meeting attendees to participate in meetings in a valuable manner. Hello and welcome to the Project Management Podcast at pm-podcast.com. I'm Cornelius Fichtner. We are coming to you live from the Creative 2018 PMI Global Conference in Los Angeles. And right now, sitting with me here on the window ledge in the middle of the hallway is Kevin Bosniak. Good afternoon, Kevin. Good afternoon, Cornelius. How are you doing? Doing fantastic. It's been a great conference. Other than the seats are a bit hard yes, here. They are. Uh, yeah, yeah, we couldn't find a, a real seat, so we're literally sitting on a window ledge for the interview here today. You had your presentation yesterday on the topic of effective meeting leadership that engages. How did it go? It went fantastic. We had a very, uh, very engaging discussion. We had a, a good crowd show up. and um, About 900 people, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, we had over 100, definitely. So it was, it was a good crowd. Yeah. What I found interesting is the fact that you're talking on a topic that I've been doing the project management podcast for about a dozen years now or so. I've had several speakers on it, and I, w- I thought we had talked about everything there is to talk about. Yet you are giving a professional presentation at the largest project management conference out there. There's still need for this topic. Very surprising. Yes, I, I, think, I think a lot of, uh, when, I, when I was working on my presentation for this year, I was thinking about really what makes me ineffective at my job and what things could be improved on. And, and really meeting management seems to still be at the heart of some of our inefficiencies of what we're doing at, at, in our, at work. So, you know, when I was looking over the topic, I said, boy, all these things, I started making a list of everything that set my schedule off mass emails, you know, 200 emails a day, double, triple, quadruple booked, starting meetings five, 10 minutes late, having too many meeting attendees in the meeting. A good example there is, let's say you invite 10 people to your meeting. If you invite three developers and the development manager to your meeting, let's say, so four people, you have, let's say you're meeting for an hour, that's four hours of time. Do you really need the three developers there? You most likely only need the development manager. He should be able to cover, he or she should be able to cover for his staff. And then you're saving three hours if you don't invite those developers. Because most likely you're going to be asking them a question that only requires two to three minutes of their time on that call, but you're going to waste an hour if you have them there. Mm-hmm. So assign the right people, assign the, the right point people, and that, that helps out immensely. But that's, that's just one of the examples of what we covered yesterday. Yeah. So the presentation comes out of your personal pain points then? It sure does. And, and I know the topic's not original. I know people have uh, been through it before. But then, you know, we took it up a step further during the presentation. We talked about, all right, these are, you know, this, this can apply in office or out of the office, you know, when you're working uh, virtually. And we really got into that remote management and how all the distractions of working virtually can really impact your effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And I thought as well, yeah, it it doesn't sound original, but frankly, project management basics doesn't sound original either. Yet there are always new project managers coming into the profession and they need to learn the basics. It's the same with meeting management. There are people who are growing in their career, they're moving forward, they're moving up, and suddenly they are charged with leading a meeting. And they've never done it before, so they have to be taught. So, yes, it may not be an original topic, but it's an important topic, and everybody needs to learn about it. You're absolutely correct. And that's like uh, one of the first things that we had actually talked about yesterday was uh, setting an agenda and actually having that agenda. I had one for my presentation yesterday, and that is, again, meeting management 101. When you send an invite, have a clear, descript meeting invite, and make sure there's an agenda included in that meeting invite. How many times do you get a meeting invite that's just two or three words. You have no idea what they're asking for. And then you go into the meeting and you're blind when you go there, right? If you have an agenda set up, people will know what they're being asked for. Oftentimes, if I get an invite and it's just a couple of words that I have no idea what they're asking for, I will decline the invite and ask that they resend it once they have the material that they want me to, re- to review beforehand and what the points or what the questions are that they need to review. And oftentimes, there's also no goal for the meeting, really. Right. So you go there, and it's just an open discussion. And, and, and then that, that hits another topic there. Sometimes you'll get the, a meeting invite that's a fact-finding meeting, and it's a 30-minute meeting. 
how many meetings can actually go get done in 30 minutes if you're fact finding? Not very often. So then you're going, you're jumping from 30 minute meeting to 30 minute meeting to 30 minute meeting, and there's really no break time between. And, and a lot of times those 30 minute meetings go to 45 minutes and so on. So you're missing your other meetings that you may actually have had to attend because you have too many 30 minute meetings. Right. How much time would you say somebody should spend on designing the agenda for their meeting? Well, if they know what they're talking about and they know what they want to get out of it, it should be no more than a few minutes. Okay. Um, if there's a little bit of information gathering that that's need to happen, you know, if they need to provide financials or something, they may have to do a little more dig- digging and provide that material along with the agenda. Mm. But the agenda itself should only be a few minutes. Yeah. And before we started our conversation here, you talked about the fact that inviting too many people is costly. It is very costly. If you invite, you really should be inviting the stakeholders, the, the people that have an interest at stake in that meeting and not inviting people that need to sit through hearing an hour long conversation. There's, there's people that should be heads down working and there's people that should be attending these meetings and actually getting the work prioritized, you know, and, and the, uh, the resources aligned, but mm. don't invite every single resource. If there's three people doing the same job, I don't think you need all three people in the meeting. You only need maybe one of them. Now that it depends on the meeting type, of course, right? If it's a, say a town hall, everyone should be there. But uh, if it's a team meeting, the whole team should be there. However, if, if it's, a, again, a design meeting or a fact-finding meeting, you, you only need the experts there. One of the slides in your presentation talks about effective time management and the meeting schedule. I think that is just as important as having the right people there and having an agenda because you want to respect everybody's time st- and start on time, finish on time, and know exactly how long this is going to be in between. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's, um, you know, as, as far as effective time management, that's one of the things um, we covered yesterday is the art of saying no. And that that is, from my end, again, 30-minute meetings. When you get a, a meeting description that's uh, very vague, you don't get an agenda, you're not sure what you're meeting on, I'll usually decline those meetings because it's just not efficient for my time. If I'm having 12, 13, 14 meetings in a day, I'm not going to attend a meeting where I'm going to go in there and have to ask what the meeting's about. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be, it's not going to be good for my time usage. Now, if somebody puts together a meeting that uh, that actually has everything I you know I need to know ahead of time, and if I actually have time, I can go in and research that a little bit and be prepared. Then we can have a very effective meeting, and it can be you know it can run fairly quick. So, um, effective time management goes in, into more of just even tracking things as simple as uh, when somebody's out of the office finding who their delegate is, who, finding out who their backup is, having that person invited to the meeting, not trying to get somebody to dial in from vacation, right? Um, effective time management is starting on time. You as the meeting presenter should be really logged in a couple minutes early with all your materials ready to go and your screen shared and ready to go so you, that when people get there, you can start the meeting on time. Now, you're always going to have people that are going to show up late, right? There's there's the people that are going to dial in. If it's a 10 o'clock meeting, they're going to dial in at 10.04 or 10.05, and then they're going to want to announce that they're there. Depending on who that person is, obviously, if it's one of your executive stakeholders, you, you may need to stop and catch them up. However, unless it's a absolutely critical meeting attendee, you should be plugging through and, and moving, moving along, and they can catch up afterwards. Uh, one of the things that we use to combat that is we actually record our meetings. So most of the WebEx tools or I should, I should say web conferencing tools such as WebEx – such as Skype, they have the ability to record the meeting, and then you can store that out on, say, a SharePoint site later on so that somebody can go in and reference the materials if they're late, if they were unable to attend the meeting, and so on. Mm. Yeah, we in our company, the, we're just a small team, four or five people. We have the rule, if you're not there, we'll start without you. That's absolutely... It's just, we respect everybody's time here. We want to get start on time, finish on time, and if you're not here, there's a good reason why you're not here. And uh, we accept that, and we'll just move forward. Well, think about that. If you have 10 people in the meeting and you start five minutes late, you're waiting on one person, you know, what, 45, 50 minutes of time you wasted, essentially? And everyone talks about the number one project issue is lack of resources, right? So (laughs) here we are wasting resource time. I think you're also suggesting that we should have one day a week where we don't have meetings. I'm suggesting at least an afternoon. I, I generally try not to schedule meetings Friday afternoon so people can get their heads down, work done for the week, their status reports, kind of get, get things pushed out the door. Um, I know some companies practice meeting-free Mondays. I, I've heard of that. So, you know, trying to avoid meetings and, and, and really filling up people's schedules is, is 
yeah, it's a fantastic idea. It's not always practical, but um, just trying to really evaluate the necessity for the meeting, I think, is really the point here. And talking about scheduling, how important is ensuring that everybody puts their vacation into their calendars? I think that's that's huge that you have um, you have them put it in there so we can see when they're unavailable in their personal calendar. Um, a lot of times there's team calendars on, say, again, a SharePoint site. Uh, it's important they have it there. And then for project managers, uh, especially using uh, tools such as Microsoft Project, you can actually go in and you can schedule your resource vacation time in there. So if you put it in there, it'll automatically adjust your project and when the deliverables will be due. So you can see, all right, this person's going to be out, so this is going to be late, so now let's move this over to someone else, or it's going to suffer. That task will suffer. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the daily stand-up meetings that Agile uses? I guess that those meetings um, should not have to be longer than 15 or 20 minutes. They should have a very set agenda that is is, uh, refreshed every day. But um, as far as those meetings, they, they should, uh, they're important, especially when you're in the middle of delivery. If you're running like biweekly sprints, they're very important to have every day. But they need to be actively attended, and they need to maintain that set agenda. All right. One of the slides in your presentation is new to me. I've never heard that term. Influential management. What is it, and how do we use it? So we have three really different types there. We have direct reports, right? Somebody that reports directly to you. And as long as you manage and prioritize their work, they're going to probably get the work done for you. And uh, you're the primary boss, for lack of a better term there. Um, Then you have the dotted lines where there's a matrix reporting where you're going to have at least some percentage of influence over the work that they're doing. And again, it's going to be based on the prioritization of your projects. Then there's influential. It's somebody that's a member of your project team. And most likely they have 20 other priorities. And it's the influential management piece is really getting them to actively engage in your project and in your meetings and actually uh, actively engage and attend those meetings. So it's up to you as the PM or as the team lead, whatever your role is, to, um, to be that project manager, the subject matter expert, and to, to effectively um, get their trust and respect and be able to lead, lead them in your meetings. All right. How do I do that? Um, what are some of the tools that you would recommend that we use? Uh, well, I, th- I think you establish yourself as a firm leader. I think you need to be a little bit authoritative. However, I think you need to also have uh, some interpersonal skills there where you learn a little bit about somebody. You learn um, what makes them tick at work. You know, what, are the, what do they like to do? What do they not, not like to do? Learn a little bit about what they like to do outside of work. You'll kind of see how, what kind of a person they are. You don't have to learn their dog's name or something like that, right? But, um, you know, get, get their trust. They're, they'll trust and respect you once you've shown a little bit of interest in their lives. And I think that will make them a much more effective person than working for you. You have a number of types of meetings listed and uh, how to use effective leadership in those. Would you mind going through those with us? Sure. There's, uh, there's really... Um, the, there's three types of meetings we want to avoid. The first is one-way meeting. And the one-way does have a use, and that's if you're having a, a status update, say a financial update maybe from your COO or CFO, something to that extent. However, other meetings, when you get in as a project manager, you don't ever want to have a, a one-way meeting. You want your project team actively engaged. So one-way meetings, as it relates to project management, you want to get those out the door, right? <laughs> Uh, no and low attendee meetings. This goes back to the influential management where somebody, they're on your project, let's say, but they have nine other projects that they're on and um, they're either unable to attend your meeting, they don't think it's a high enough priority. We want to avoid those meetings as well. We want to get as many attendees and we want to have a meeting that's purposeful. So if we have, going back to having the, the right agenda, having, having the right meeting invite in place, that should hopefully improve those. Mm-hmm. And just to confirm, when you say we want to avoid those kind of meetings, it's not that we want to avoid going to them. We want to avoid scheduling those. Exactly. Well, setting exactly. those up. As so a if start. I set up a yeah. meeting with five people and they look at it and say, well, this doesn't provide any value and I have this much more important meeting to go to at this time, well, then it's not effective, right? So we want to avoid, absolutely, we want to avoid setting those up. The last is the waste of time meeting, and we've all been through those. <laughs> You know, it's uh, that's the joke at the end of the meeting where you go, well, this could have just been an email, you know, or <laughs> did it even need to be an email? This was all common sense knowledge anyway, right? So that's the third one we want to kind of avoid. Um, what we really want to get at is participative meetings, the engaged meetings, and that's where we have active 
um, engaged participation in the meeting and high attendance in those meetings. Okay. You told me that the number one topic that you spent most of the time on in your presentation was virtual meetings. That's correct. Let's switch over to those. Other than the virtual meeting, nobody's in the same room versus, you know, we're all in the same room. What is the big difference in terms of leadership? In terms of leadership, it's keeping people engaged. Okay. So your, your, your point of contention there is, is that somebody is, say, working out of their home office. They have their cell phone. They have maybe their kids in the background coming home from school. They have a lot of different disruptions that can happen when you're virtual. So what we talked about yesterday a fair amount is really looking at how you can keep that more like you're in the office together. You need driving that environment towards a, a, a commonality of if you're working in the office or not working in the office. So here's an example. We, uh, if you're presenting, if you have a web conference, always have something on the screen, even if it's your agenda and that's all people are looking at. Give them something to look at so they're focusing on what the meeting is. Sometimes people, we have people in office and working out of the house at the same type of meeting. From that end, make sure the people in the office are either in a conference room looking at the same screen as everyone at home or have them in their offices or in their cubicles doing the same thing online on that WebEx so they can see exactly what everyone else can see. Put them all in the same playing field. Um, One other thing we talked about out of the house uh, when people are working remotely is have a headset. Also have a video camera, a web camera that's under $100 and you have you have video conferencing instantly. You can see people. You, it, it'll help you from talking over people. That's one of the biggest problems with remote meetings. People just you have multiple people talking at the same time. So with the video conferencing, that helps people uh, be able to see when it's their turn to talk and when, when there's an opening to talk. It also helps you see uh, the facial or the body language of the person you're talking with. Mm-hmm. In-person meetings usually have ground rules like, okay, Turn your phones off, close your laptops, sit up straight, pay attention. What are some of the ground rules that you set up for virtual meetings? That's the exact same thing. You need to establish ground rules. Except close your laptop, don't, because otherwise the meeting (laughs) tool won't work. Laptop open, stay off your instant message, stay off, you know, check in your email, stay off your personal phone. Pay attention. We're, um, you know, one of the suggestions we had from one of the participants yesterday was, uh, that they actually will notify the team that we're going to reach out to everyone that's on the call. So we're going to actually ask you a question through the co- throughout the call. So they may, that makes sure that they stay actively engaged and they pay attention. And when I go through and I set my agenda, a lot of times I will actually have my bullet-pointed agenda and I will actually have names after it for who I'm expecting to speak on the topic. Mm-hmm. So that helps, I think, with engagement as well. The good thing about being in the same room in a meeting is there's usually whiteboards right there and if I need to explain something that's more complex I just get up and start drawing things right what about virtual team meetings with virtual teams uh there, there's a couple couple of comments I have on that you you have the same thing where you can you can get on you can get on to uh, Microsoft Word or PowerPoint or Visio. you share your screen you can show what you're working through uh you oftentimes can uh, give control to some of the others on the phone so they can take over and kind of show you what they're thinking so again you have that virtual whiteboard so I think you have those options as well. And the other thing that's, I think, critical when you're running virtual meetings is that you record the meetings. So that, say you're working with an overseas group, you have a meeting at 3 p.m. Central Time. Well, that's 2 or 3 a.m. their time. Uh, they're not able to attend at that time. So you record the meeting, let them reference it later, and ask questions. Okay. In your presentation, I see one bullet point. I'm not quite sure what I'm seeing, so (laughs) this is something that you have to explain to me. Remote conference call exercise, mobile app status update. So It it sounds intriguing. (laughs) So what we did yesterday is we, we did essentially what you could call a case study, and we took five chairs and five different roles here we had a um, I should say six different roles really we had myself as the project manager Uh, we had an executive stakeholder a developer a QA tester QA manager and a business analyst and I took five chairs and faced them outwards so nobody could see each other and they were given a script to read off of we had dogs barking in the background we had horns honking (laughs) we you know we had uh, and the executive staring at his phone not paying attention so we went through a lot of the challenges that you face when you're running a remote call. 
After that, uh, that session was through, we took all the chairs and turned them around and had everyone face each other and actually had them passing the microphone back and forth through the conversation and read the same script over, and it was much more fluid. So it just showed the actively disengaged versus actively engaged, I guess, meeting types. Yeah, it's quite obvious. And this is frankly something that I noticed as well. As soon as the camera is on, you know your people see you. Right. right, and you want to make sure that you're on your best best behavior. Even right. if you're just sort of looking to the side and and checking your email, I can tell. Right, I can clearly tell that you're doing something else right there. Right, yeah. exactly. At the end of the presentation, what did you hope that your attendees would take back with them? At the end of the presentation, I think the, the number one thing I wanted them to take back is just to really think about what they were doing when they were scheduling meetings and really the effectiveness is quality versus quantity, right? We want to make sure we have quality with the meetings and that we're not just calling meetings to have, for the sake of having another meeting, right? I think that was the biggest thing to make sure that they, they were thinking when they came back, you know, well, as the meeting coordinator, I need to, I need to be there two minutes early, you know, and um, with people being late. Let's peop- let, end your meeting five minutes early. If the meeting starts at 9 a.m., end it at 9.55. Don't end it at 10, 10 a.m. because odds are they're going to want to get a drink of water. They're going to need to go to the bathroom. They're not going to make it to their 10 o'clock now because you just ran them right up to the hour. Mm-hmm. So really just thinking about their future effectiveness. We started out with this presentation learning that it all grew out of your own pain points. Correct. So if you could talk to your younger self from a few years ago, before you started building up all those pain points, what would you tell yourself how to run better meetings? I would have given myself a lot of the advice that we just talked about. And, uh, Here, I would have, here's the presentation, <laughs> right. Kevin. Read it. I've written that in the future for you. I would have told myself not to, uh, not to fall into that trap because I think at some point I may have fallen into that trap where I, you know, I started scheduling meeting after meeting. And, and, and now um, you know, I, I think about it. In fact, when, when people do, uh, regardless, uh, when people do send me, me meeting invites, again, if the if data is not there, if the detail is not there, I really second guess if I should actually go to the, those meetings and I guess maybe if I had questioned that 20 years ago, maybe <laughs> you know that would have helped me be more effective then. But If our listeners would like to learn more about how to run effective meetings, what would you recommend to them? Any books to read, specifics, any specific articles to read, any specific courses to take, uh, any meetings to attend? There's actually, <laughs> hopefully not. Um, there's actually a couple of websites that were referenced in my presentation. Uh, one is meetingsift.com that actually had some very good information on what different types. What is that types. again? Meetingsift.com. S-I-F-T? S-I-F-T.com. Okay. And um, they had some good information on uh, different meetings there. And then there's um, some even more in-depth uh, information at lucidmeetings.com. Lucid meetings. I know about lucid dreaming. I, I don't know about <laughs> lucid meetings. So they, they had a, a very interesting article there on 16 different types of meetings based on different criteria. And so it gives you some, I guess, input into different types and how to, how to manage those different types of meetings. But everything's an opinion there, really. It's, it's, I think it, the effectiveness of running your meeting really comes from your audience, your target audience. Who are you working with, right? And is it... Is it a three-person small group meeting? Is it a 20-person meeting? And that's really going to be where your effectiveness comes through. You're going to have to know how to run and adapt to each situation, right? Mm -hmm. What is your best tip for our listeners? Usually, you know, as project managers working in a matrix organization, like you said, influence, right, is important. Who are struggling to get people to come to their meetings, to attend their meetings, what can they do? If it's a large group of people, I think they need to, and they're consistently not getting a a good attendance to their meetings from a a large uh, group, they need to look at the the priority of their meeting. Clearly, um, either they're not, they're not getting the point across how important the project is, or management has not bought into it or is not pushing the fact that it's a top priority meeting. In that case, I work with, uh, I work with management and we determine where the priority lies and make sure that they communicate from top down what the prioritization is so you can get that influential management and get those folks into that meeting. If it's a meeting that's not that important, then you really need to look at should you even be having that meeting or should you push it off to maybe the next quarter or another time. If our listeners have any more questions for you, how can they reach out and touch with you? Uh, they can reach me on LinkedIn or uh, via email, Kevin Waz, K-E-V-I-N-W-O-Z at gmail.com. Excellent. Thank you for your time today, Kevin. All right. Thank you, Cornelius. Cornelius.